first of all, the idea of evolution. I'm, I'm sure most of us have, have, have come across this and have a, a basic idea of how the theory of evolution works. Then I'm going to try and show you the, the impossibility of evolution. Then we're going to look at what is theistic evolution. It's also known as evolutionary creationism uh, and other, uh, some of the names associated with it. And what we're going to find is that in order for evolutionists, because the, the main place obviously we hear the, the account of creation is in the book of Genesis, and evolutionists who say, well, I, I want to sort of believe that God was behind this, that they have a problem because they have to dismantle the first, uh, basically the first quarter of the book of Genesis. <clears throat> So what they say is, well, the creation wasn't six literal days um, that they say, well, Adam wasn't, you know, a literal person. And, and most of Genesis 1 to 11 isn't literal. Um, they then uh, point out that Cain's wife must have come from somewhere. And so she must have been around already and already sort of evolved for him. And then they look at the contradictions between Genesis 2 and they try and dismantle it. And I'm going to try and address each of those issues. And then finally, the most worrying thing, I think, especially to what young people in our community is that this is a threat to faith. Once you get, once you say, well, I, I don't need to believe uh, that God created the earth in six days, it challenges everything else. We don't need to believe in the virgin birth. I don't need to believe in the existence of God. I know I don't need to believe all these other things. I don't need to believe that Jesus died for me. I don't need to believe that he's going to return. And it dismantles the need for faith. And we are saved by faith. So just to, to, to recap, uh, I just need to rearrange my screen a little bit here. That's a bit better. Um, <clears throat> so the basic idea of evolution is that life forms reproduce and become more numerous. And we see this everywhere, don't we? If I look out in my garden now, there's a, there's a, a tree with uh, sort of berries, seeds and things on it. And if all of those seeds were to grow, we'd have more and more and more trees. And animals, we know, in the absence of any predators and in the right conditions, will grow and reproduce and become more and more numerous. Um, and we know that life forms compete to survive. I've already, I've already mentioned predators. So the fact that, the, that there isn't one particular form of animal that dominates a particular area is because animals, uh, they, you have pred pred predators which prey on other animals and you get an equilibrium sort of comes about. And... There's this idea that each offspring slightly differs from their parents. And that's true. My, my offspring are very different to me, um, me and my wife. And that, that's, that's true. Offspring slightly differ from their parents. You get slightly different variants. But what evolutionists say is, well, you get mutations, which change that where the genes are slightly different. And that change in the genes gets passed on. And eventually this gets passed, the, the genes change sufficiently over sufficient generations that you get, get a different species. Well, I'm not going to blind you with scientific detail, but there are mechanisms in place in nature which prevent this from happening. So putting it very simply, if you have a cat, it will, if a cat, your cat will give birth to a kitten. It will grow up to be a cat, which will give birth to a kitten, which will grow up to be a cat, which will give birth to a kitten, and so on and so on and so forth. There is no point where that cat stops, starts being something else. Scientists try to replicate um, this slight change in, in, in species that is what evolution requires, a changing in species. Remember Darwin's book is called The Origin of Species. And what he uh, basically proposed was that one species of creature can change into different species. There are mechanisms in nature that prevent that. The genes of a particular species are fixed. They, they, they cannot change. Scientists have tried to... Um, replicate evolution if you like they like doing this with fruit flies because fruit flies the, the lifespan is very short and they produce lots of offspring so you give fruit flies uh, good conditions to, to to breed in and then scientists bombard them with radiation all kinds of things in the hope of producing slightly different mutated forms of fruit flies which will then um uh, breed themselves and become a, a species of new uh, a new kind of fruit fly well the bad news is the mutated ones all die and they're not very good at being fruit flies, mutate, mutated things. I'll just give an example here of, um, oh, where is it, uh, of, of a mutation. So what evolution re relies on is beneficial mutations. So the idea that maybe you had some creature years ago that was straining to, to, to eat the leaves off a tree. And so its offspring, the ones, uh, any of its offspring that had a slightly longer neck, were able to eat the tree leaves better and they survived better. And as this went on, you ended up with giraffes. 
doesn't work like that. Here's, I, I've not got this on a slide, but here's a picture uh, in the newspaper a couple of years ago. And this is a, a little dog, a little puppy that was born, and it's got six legs. It's a genetic mutation. Okay. So with six legs, obviously this dog is going to be able to run 50% quicker than another dog with four legs. Well, it's not, it can hardly move. It, it, it had to have lots of operations because uh, it could, could hardly move. In fact, they, uh, they, it says here in the, in the thing, they, they called it, um, I think they called it Roo uh, because it hopped around like a kangaroo was the only way it could get around. So this puppy is either halfway to uh, um, evolving into a spider or to a kangaroo. But the point is about genetic mutations that evolution relies upon is that most of them are not good for whatever, for the original species, they're, they're, they're that adverse mutation, or, uh, and a lot of mutations make the creatures, make the, the offspring sterile anyway, that's, that it's mutated into. But evolutionists press on. They say, well, if these differences are beneficial. The offspring is more likely to survive predators and competitors, and they pass that advantage on to their offspring. And these differences accumulate over many generations, the neck of some creature getting longer because it's easier to, to reach the leaves. And then over time, populations can split or branch off into new species. And that bit there just doesn't happen. New species do not form from old species. You can cross animals. Um, so there's a creature that, which is a cross between a lion and a tiger, but lions and tigers are very closely related genetically. And you're not evolving anything there. You're not changing the species. You're merely mixing the genes. Okay, and, and there's, as I say, there's processes in nature which make sure the genes do not change. And these processes, according to evolutionists, known as evolution, are responsible for the many diverse life forms seen in the world. And so you'll see in your science books things like this. I remember doing biology at school, and we did the classification of animals, and we said, right, here's a, here's a, um, is a, a wood louse that's got lots of legs and is a bee that's got six legs and this kind of thing. And you, and you start classifying animals into whether they're invertebrates or insects and all this kind of thing. But there's no set, there was no sense in which one had somehow evolved over time into the other. And yet that is essentially what scientists do. And they look at fossils of things and say, well, here's a fossil that was a, a bit like a, looked a bit like a horse, but was smaller than a horse. And here's a, something which is a bit bigger and a bit bigger. And then they link these fossils together. And there you go, the theory of evolution. Notice it's only the, on this um, tree of life, as they call it, it's only the humans in the corner, which are shown as somehow evolving over this period of time. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, yeah, we'll go, we'll go into this picture. When I first researched this on the internet and found this, I genuinely thought it was a spoof. Now, people who believe in evolution, and it is a belief, it's no different to having a belief in, a, in a, any other religion, it is a belief, because there's, there's just, the evidence for it has to be interpreted in such a way that, to support this. I, I would venture to say that the evidence for evolution doesn't exist okay but people believe it because they, they they want to believe it now when i first saw this i i generally thought it was a spoof i don't want to mock other people's belief and i say i think evolution is a belief but i generally thought this was a joke it says the story of the origin of whales is one of evolution's most fascinating tales and one of the best examples scientists have of natural selection and this is from a um the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, website of it's an American organ scientific organization and a website called LiveScience.com. And this is about the evolution of the whale. And you see there, they believe that whales uh, evolved from a, a creature called the Synonyx, which was a sort of a little tigery kind of thing, top left there, and over 60 million years became the modern humpback whale that we see today. Okay, so. First of all, we're relying on very tiny genetic changes happening to that synonyx top left that somehow it then evolves into the next creature down. There would need to be billions and billions of mutations in the genes of that creature for it to become the next one. And those billions, that those mutations, most genetic mutations result in something which is sterile and is less able to survive than what it mutated from. The scientist's friend, of course, is the, is the 16 million years. So evolutionists rely on something called uniformitarianism. 
Uniformitarianism is the idea that the earth and all the conditions on the earth have been pretty much the same for millions and millions of years to allow all this to go on. These are, of course, the same scientists who tell us that we're now experiencing climate change at a very rapid rate. And there's plenty of evidence to say that the earth has not been the same for millions of years. In fact, going on to another bit of a, a subject of mine, the Genesis flood, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that uh, 5,000 years ago, before the flood, the climate and the, the geology of this earth was very much different to how it is now. And there's a huge amount of science that supports that. So the idea that everything has gone on, uh, you know, because the, the evolution relies on creatures trying to outwit their predators, basically. Now, if they're trying to outwit climate change and, and um, huge changes in, in the geology of the earth as well, you know, they're, they're too busy trying to outwit their predators to evolve. So this, these millions of years are the friend of the evolutionist, giving time for, the, for a tiny mutation to take place and for more creatures of that mutation to happen. But the fact is, each of the creatures you hear, see here, which supposedly where one has evolved to the other, are, are totally different creatures. They're totally different things. And, and, and you're relying on a mechanism which simply doesn't happen for one species to change to another. So you've got these different forms and, it, and, and the evolutionists say this, in, in, I'll just read the white bit here, right, right, the white writing says, the critical piece of evidence came in 1994 when paleontologists, that's fossil hunters, found the fossilized remains of Ambulocetus natans. Now, I think he's the third or fourth one down. Um, yeah, he's the third one down. Uh, the fossilized remains of Ambulocetus natans, an animal whose name literally means swimming, walking whale. Now, you're, you're trying to tell me that a thing called a the thing which is a swimming, walking whale. Firstly, you're going to tell me this exists based on some bones that you found. And secondly, you're going to tell me that this was, um, you know, some, some kind of creature that then, it then evolved in, into the whale. And it says its forelimbs had fingers and small hooves, but its hind feet were enormous given its size. It was clearly adapted for swimming, but it was also capable of moving clumsily on land, much like a seal. This sounds like something which is going to be picked off by its predators in minutes. It doesn't sound like something which is going to, to, to survive. When it swam, the ancient creature moved like an otter, pushing back its hind feet and undulating its spine and tail. OK, and this is based on some fossilised remains. It doesn't seem to occur to them that they found the fossilised remains of maybe um, a horse and an otter in the same place. It doesn't seem to occur to them. OK, um, now I, I, I challenge you to go onto this website, find this picture, show it to your friends and say, do you believe this? Because this is what you have to believe if you believe in evolution. It just seems too mad to me. Uh, and, it's, and you're relying on processes which simply do not fit in with the science we have. It doesn't work. Evolution requires the ability for one species to change into another. I've put Sela there from the Psalms. Pause and consider. Species do not change from one to another. If you have a cat, its offspring are going to be a cat. The form evolution requires the formation of the first simple organisms from complex chemicals. Again, it doesn't happen. It, it, scientists have tried to do this. It doesn't happen. Evolution requires the production of complex chemical molecules by chance. It, it doesn't happen. Evolution requires about four billion years with the environment being more or less the same for most of that time, i.e. land, water, atmosphere, sunlight, etc. It almost certainly hasn't happened. Scientific evidence points to the fact that it hasn't happened. And it requires you to ignore scientific theory. Do you remember at school when you did about science, there was that circle where you said you had a you have a theory, and then you test your theory. So sorry, you you yeah, you, you see some find some evidence. You have a theory, and then you test your theory, and you see if see if your theory fits fits the evidence. And if it doesn't, you go back and review your theory. Evolution is the other way around. It's a theory which people said this is what happened, and now we're going to run around and find some evidence to prove it. And that's where the fossil record comes in. They're saying this is the evidence that proves it. Now, it's the evidence that lots of different creatures have lived and died. It doesn't prove evolution. And as I say, to believe in evolution, you need a huge amount of faith. Even more faith, I think, than to believe in God. So let's compare the two things. Evolution. Can we prove evolution? Well, it, it, it isn't actually scientific. It can't be verified. It can't be observed. The so-called evidence is forced to fit the theory. Whereas if we believe in God, it's, it says, well, taste and see that the Lord is God. We, 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 we need faith. We can believe that God is there. 
What is needed to believe evolution? We need blind faith based on time spans and impossible scenarios far beyond our comprehension. The idea that that synolics thing evolved into the humpback whale, you, you, none of us can imagine that. None of us can comprehend all the, the things that have got to happen for that to possibly happen. So you need faith in something for which there's no evidence and which you can't imagine happening. It's, it's almost outside of our comprehension. But people are blinded by science. Whereas believing in God is faith based on observation and we need some humility to say, maybe say, well, we can't answer all the questions. What's the benefit of evolution? Well, you see this a lot. It's called acceptance by peers. There's a thing called the scientific community. And if you stand out as somebody who doesn't agree with the mainstream, mainstream scientific theories like evolution, uh, then you'll find it very difficult to get on. Um, What's the benefit of believing in God? Well, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There is great comfort to be found in believing in, in God as the creator. What about the impossibility of evolution? Well, Charles Darwin said this in his book, The Origin of Species. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. OK. Well, let's look at an example. We've all got uh, most, most of us have got at least two of these. <laughs> two, the, two eyes. Um, here's the human eye, and that's a very simplified model of it. Okay, I, I, I believe in our audience we have a, an optician and a and a, doc, and a retired doctor, or they certainly used to be. Um, well, here's the, here's the eye and, and, and the complexity of it. So, could this have evolved by, comp, by by millions of tiny mutations, if you like? Well. The retina, the bit at the back of your eye, it's got 125 million rods and 7 million cones. These are light sensitive cells that produce electrical impulses on detecting white light and colored light respectively. So these are light sensitive solar panels effectively. And there's 130 plus million of them on the back of each of your eyes. The optic nerve, which can carries the information from your eye to the brain, has an average of over a million fibres connecting the rods and cones to the brain, and the optic nerve transmits the electrical impulses from the rods and cones to the brain at a rate of 100 million per second. Okay, so you're, you're, um, you're, you're, the, the information between your brain and your eye is faster than broadband. The human eye is, is made in a few months. It's probably less than that from conception. The, the eyes are formed in, in really a few months, including the data connection to the brain. Now let's think about this. Just think about this. What we're saying, the, the human eye, when, 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 a, when conception takes place in the womb, the human eye forms, all, all, all the, the stuff within the eye forms really within a few months, okay? Obviously babies are born, they're, they're, their eyes are working. Um, so it's fully formed in nine months, okay? fully formed effectively in, in nine months. Evolution requires that ability, that technology, if you like, that capacity to, 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 for that to fully form. Remember, we're starting off with two cells. That has got to evolve, hasn't it? The, the ability to do all that has got to evolve over successive generations. It's just mind boggling. The human eye focuses automatically, it adjusts exposure to light automatically, it cleans itself automatically, it works as a pair for stereoscopic vision, and it could not possibly have evolved by numerous successive slight modifications. It has to have been designed, it has to have been created in one go. It couldn't possibly come about by, 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 by chance. It just... Evolutionists say the eye exists and therefore must have evolved. I'm not making that up. The eye exists and therefore must evolve. See, we've got the theory, we're sticking to it. I haven't got any evidence, but we're going to stick to it. The eye exists and therefore must have evolved. The theory is true, even though we can't show how it works, even though we have, don't have the evidence. The Bible says the hearing ear, the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. Just have a look at that chapter that we... Um, that we read a moment ago. It's talking about God, how God knows us. In verse one, it says, Lord, thou hast searched and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. God knows even our thoughts. Okay. And it says in, in verse um, 
13, in the authorised version, it reads this. It says, that has possessed my reins, that has covered me in my mother's womb. And that word possessed my reins is you, you, you form my, in, my, my innards, my, my internal organs. You formed my internal organs. And that covered me in my mother's womb. The word covers there is, is, is knitted together. You formed me in my mother's womb. God has created and arranged all these things. Verse 14, I'll praise thee for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. So here's another one that couldn't possibly have evolved. The human heart and circulatory system. Arteries carry blood from the heart to everywhere in the body and veins carry it back. But there's a system, there's two, two sets of, of, of pipe work going through your body. <clears throat> There's pipes between the heart and the lungs, and there's pipes from the heart to everywhere else. The heart does two things. It pumps blood to the lungs, where the where oxygen is, is put into the blood, and then it brings it back to the heart, and then it pumps it around your body, where the oxygen keeps everything moving, and then brings it back to the heart again. And it's constantly going around. There you go. An amazing system. So there's two different organs involved, lots of plumbing. Your heart is about the size of your fist. The average human heart beats over 2.5 billion times in a lifetime. And there's, there's the maths. It pumps oxygenated blood from the lungs to everywhere around the body and pumps the oxygenated blood from everywhere around the body back to the lungs. Amazing. Chance? Could this have come about by chance from a, um, a, a, a some substance, which was a, a set of complex molecules that somehow got more and more complex and, and ended up was able to reproduce itself and somehow get more and more complex into a living creature. It's mind boggling the idea that, that might have happened. The human heart is made in less than a month, including the connection with some body parts. It self maintains, it produces power for itself. It automatically adjusts its output according to demand. You don't start running and then think, I better make my heart go faster to cope with this. It does it automatically, doesn't it? Adrenaline is put into your bloodstream, which makes your heart go faster. It's part of a system, the heart, delivering oxygen, nutrients and hormones and removing waste from around the body. It could not possibly have evolved by numerous successive slight modifications. So evolutionists say very little. The Bible says, you form me, you form my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I'm sure the, uh, the medically minded people in front of you might, might be able to recognise what that is. Um, it says in Leviticus there, doesn't it? The life of all flesh is the blood thereof. And that is a representation of a very complex molecule called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is, is, a com is a very complex molecule. It exists in the red blood cells in our blood. If our blood was uh, water, then you'd be able to dissolve oxygen in water. There's, you can dissolve oxygen in water. That's not a problem. You ask a fish. Can dissolve oxygen in water. Um, but if you've got hemoglobin, you can carry 70 times more oxygen than you can without it. it it's within the hemoglobin molecule, there's a, 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 some atoms of iron, there's iron in it. And that gives it a structure where it kind of clicks between two structures like that, the hemoglobin molecule. It clicks between two shapes, it snaps between the two shapes. And in one shape, it can hold loads of oxygen in, in, in molecules. And in the other shape, it clicks and it releases the oxygen. And it's doing this constantly. And that's how it carries the oxygen around your body. So at some point, the haemoglobin molecule must have, have evolved as well, because that's what the system requires. That system requires haemoglobin to make it work, to make it as, if, as efficient and effective as it is. Consider these things, the ear, the brain, Reproduction, bones and the skeleton, the digestive system, even human morality, they couldn't possibly have evolved by numerous successive slight modifications. And I've only looked at human beings there. So the evolutionist says, well, must have been God behind it then. Must have been God, God making all these changes happen for us to, uh, us to end up with this. So theistic idea, evolution embraces the idea that life began under the direction of God perhaps billions of years ago, and was brought to its current state of God through a process of evolutionary biological transitions. And that the people are trying to hang on to this idea of Darwinian evolution and then say, well, God was behind it because we, we like the benefits of believing in God. And all the evidence seems to point to evolution. The evidence doesn't point to evolution at all. 
let it go. The fossil record does not support evolution. Why say that God was behind evolution? Well, you know, I want to believe in God, but all the evidence seems to support evolution. It doesn't. I can't believe that all that random, I can't believe all that random chance required with evolution. Some great intelligence must have been behind it. Great intelligence was behind creation, not behind evolution. Uh, we'll come back to this in a second. Evolution is science and therefore must be true. So the Bible must be made to fix, fit the facts. And so evolutionists ignore, as we'll see in a moment, the bits of the Bible that don't seem to fit. So evolutionists have to dismantle the book of Genesis. The evolutionists' view is that the six days of creation are six one-day visions of longer epochs of time. That's not what it says. It says in six days. They say the six days cannot, can't be literal. They say the six days are a vision given on one day, the, the revelatory day. Because um, in Gen Genesis 2, verse 4, it says, these are, the day, sorry, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. They say there was this, this revelatory day where God revealed all the things he'd done in the billions of years before. It's simply not what the Bible says. If I were to say to you all oh, back in the day before the Internet, there wasn't one particular day before the Internet, was there? It's just talking about a period of time. OK, the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. So the biblical support for the literal six days, well, there's this sort of idea of the Sabbath, isn't there? Now, if you think about it, if the. If there was one day, if the seventh day was when God revealed what he'd done on six previous massive lengths of time, then uh, our working week, each of our working days would be billions of years long and then we'd have one day off. Because the model of the seven day week is based on the Genesis account. In, in Exodus there it says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, uh, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day rested and was requested. The fact that we have a six day week and a seventh day of, of, of rest is testament to, to what God said. It bears out the Genesis record. Biblical support for six literal days. Well, if we follow the biblical account, then we've had around 6,000 years since creation. Peter tells us one day in the Lord was a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The six days represent the 6,000 years since creation and they're about to end. There's about to be a day of rest because Jesus is going to return and reign upon the earth a thousand years uh, to set up his kingdom upon the earth. Um, what about the evolutionist view of Adam? Because the Bible makes it quite clear that Adam was the first man. But if you say, if you take the evolutionist view and the theistic evolutionist view, you know, the, the, their, their view must be, well, Adam was kind of, everything had evolved, and Adam was just the first person God picked on to, 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 to work with. So they say, well, Adam was either a metaphor or a myth. He and his family were not real persons. And they say well, Genesis 1 to 11 wasn't a real record of events. So there's the flood gone for a start. Um, they say, well, Adam lived about 200,000 years ago when humans had evol evolved to the point where God could do business with them. Or Adam was a separate creation put into a population that had evolved. OK. Simply not supported by, uh, by the Bible. Well, let's, let's pick apart Adam a bit. The biblical support for Adam. Well, Adam is specifically referred to in nine other places in the Old and New Testaments as if he was a real person. Uh, there's the genealogies in, in, in various places. Well, so why don't we stop at Adam? If we go to Luke chapter 3, well, we won't go to Luke chapter 3, but it records the, the family line of Jesus going back through the Old Testament to Adam. Why not stop at Adam? Why not go to go back through, you know, to Ugger the Neanderthal and beyond, beyond that? Why does it start and stop at Adam? Simple, because Adam was the first man that God created. He wasn't uh, it didn't mark a, a stage in human evolution where God suddenly decided to talk to people. And Adam calls his wife Eve, the giver of life. If they were just part of a race of all being, then she wasn't the giver of life to all humans, because there were lots of almost evolved humans running around nearby anyway. And also Jesus and the, the Paul refer to Eve. In Genesis 2, Adam inspects all the animals and a help 
meat cannot be found for him. And, and, and basically what happens here is Adam is shown that all the animals have different genetic makeup to him. He's shown that the animals are genetically different to him. Okay. According to theistic evolutionists, of course, he was just one of a race of beings. So why couldn't he find a wife? And you have this fantastic scenario where, where if, if, these, if the theistic evolutionist is right, then Adam was basically looking around and saying, well, none of these women are quite evolved enough for me yet. And God says, right, I'll have to, find, I'll have to make one for you then. It's, it's nonsense. The Bible makes no mention anywhere of any evolved humans before Adam. And if we maintain that Adam was not a real historical person, then the following, then we have to conclude the Bible is full of lies and errors, and all the people listed there are wrong. So, what about Adam's family? They say, well, the evolutionists say, well, Adam's family must have. Uh, people are trying to fit the theistic evolutionists. People are trying to fit the Bible record to evolution. Say, well, Adam's uh, Cain's wife must have come from these pre-Adamic race. They must have come from uh, other nearly evolved forms on, on the earth. Well, the Bible make, makes no mention of any uh, evolved pre-Adamic race, but it tells us that Adam begat sons and daughters, and we can only conclude that Cain and Abel uh, were, were two of them, and Cain's wife must have been one of them as well. We're told in the Bible that Cain murdered Abel and was then worried about a revenge killing. And they, people say, oh, these, this is this, these other evolved um, people around. There were lots of them, uh, uh, you know. But the Bible makes, makes no mention of evolved humans. And why would they want to avenge the death of somebody unconnected to them anyway? And then they say, well, Genesis is, it prevent, it presents two very different situations. Um, you've got two versions of the beginning in Genesis 1 and 2. They say, well, you know, because they're trying to dismantle the Genesis account. They say, well, Genesis 1 and 2 are different. The point is they complement each other, Genesis 1 and 2, just as the four gospel records give us different uh, aspects of the life of Christ. They don't contradict each other. They complement each other. Genesis 1 is the description of all life being created. And in Genesis 2, we have the detail of Adam and Eve being created. And Jesus talked about Genesis 1 and 2 as one historical event in the context of marriage. He says God created Adam and Eve, and he says, therefore, let a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Um, he, he, he talks about one and two in the, Genesis 1 and 2 in the same context. Jesus clearly believed they were both the same, talking about the same things. Theistic evolutionists, they, they, they try to describe, say, well, Genesis 1 and 2 are, are, are different. I'm not going to, I'm going to move on quite quickly through this. They try to say, well, Genesis 1 and 2, 2 are different. Um, in Genesis 1, plants are, 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 we have plants before animals, before humans, whereas in Genesis 2, Adam's created, and then animals, and then a garden is planted. But it's different ways of looking at the same thing. The sequence of, gen of creation is in Genesis 1. And I believe Genesis 2 is Adam recording his viewpoint of what had ha his account of, of, of what had happened, how he was created, he was formed, and then he was he was presented with the animals to, to realize he was different to them, and then he was placed into a garden. It's not even it's not creation in a different order. Um, that's kind of the the, the same thing um, we, we mentioned a moment ago. So I'm, I'm going to move on uh, because of time. Um, they say, well, Genesis one and two give us different accounts of creation, and, and, and they don't. I'll, I'll come back to this. I'll, I'll, I'll move on from that for, because of time. They, in trying to dismantle the Genesis record, they say, well, Genesis 1 2 use different names for God. It's Elohim, the mighty ones, in chapter 1, and Yahweh Elohim, the, the name of God, in, in, in chapter 2. And the solution is that the Elohim, the angels, were the ancients of creation, whereas Adam has a relationship with the Lord God uh, in, in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 is written from Adam's viewpoint, and he had a relationship with the Almighty God, whereas the, the angels, the mighty ones, were God's agents in Genesis 1. Um, again, I'm going to move on from that because we, we've covered quite a bit of that, that anyway. The point is, if the book of Genesis is not true, and to say that God was behind somehow an evolution happening over billions of years in a uniformitarian system of the earth being constant. If the book of Genesis isn't true, then the following fundamental doctrines are undermined 
all must be disregarded. And I'd like to open our Bibles now. Uh, I've not got any more, I don't think on, uh, any a little bit more on PowerPoint. I'd like to open our Bibles now and look at some of these verses. So come with me to Matthew chapter 19. And this is, uh, I, I mentioned this, this is the record of, uh, of uh, Jesus talking about marriage. And in verse four, Jesus answered them and said unto them, have you not read that he that made them at the beginning made them male and female? So Jesus is saying, I believe in Genesis chapter one. He that believed he made them made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Genesis chapter two. Therefore, they are noble twain, but one flesh uh, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Okay, so Genesis, Jesus believed in the record of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, literally as they are recorded. Romans chapter 5, uh, a fundamental doctrine to us. Genesis, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. And this is talking about our relationship with God through, uh, through Jesus, isn't it? Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, so much more being reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. It's how we are saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement or the reconciliation. We're in a relationship with God through the death and resurrection of his son. And it says, therefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And verse 18 says, therefore, as by the offence of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon on all men unto justification of life. Um, and verse back to verse 15, for if through the offence of one many be dead, much more through the grace of God and by the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So the one man that entered sin into the world was Adam in the Genesis record. Now, if the Genesis record is wrong, sin has not come about into the world. Uh, the, the consequence of death as a result of the sinful nature we have from Adam hasn't come into the world. And there's no need for Jesus to die for our sins. There's no need for Jesus to have died to put us back into relationship with God. And you're denying the need for Jesus. And it's dismantling the faith that we have. It's a very has a very corrosive effect on all the other things that, that we believe uh, and that our salvation is based upon believing. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. Paul writes, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man, Adam, came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. By Jesus came the resurrection of the dead. So if Jesus didn't need to die and rise from the dead to, to overturn the curse, if the curse didn't exist, if Adam didn't exist, if Adam wasn't a literal person, it relies on the existence of Adam. In fact, one of the genealogies in the, in the Gospels um, refers to Adam as the first son of God, Jesus, the son of God, and traces genealogy back and says to Adam, which was the son of God, it says Adam was the first son. For as in Adam, verse 22, all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Those who have the, um, who, who, who are descendants of Adam will die, and we're all descendants of Adam, that's why we die. It's not because of a specific sin we've committed, it's because we've inherited the nature of Adam, the finite lifespan that Adam was given because of his, his disobedience to God. We've all inherited that. But in Christ, we can all be made alive. If we associate ourselves with Christ through death, through, through resurrection, try that again. If we associate ourselves with Christ's death and resurrection through baptism, then we are in Christ and we can be alive. We, we, we are free of that curse of being a, a descendant of, of Adam. Verse uh, 45 there of, of 1 Corinthians 15. It says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. God breathed into Adam and gave him life. Um, the, the last Adam, that's Jesus, um, was made a quickening spirit, able to give us life. God gave Adam life. Jesus can give us life and give us eternal life. And that whole idea completely disappears. If you say that Adam wasn't real, he was just a myth. He was just an allegory. He was just somebody that God picked on when he could have picked anyone else. Hebrews chapter 11, the, the chapter of faith, of course, verses four and five. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, example to us, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. 
and, uh, and there verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, that means he was moved from one place to another so he wouldn't see either be killed or see people being killed. He had this testimony that he pleased God. Well, if Genesis, if the first 11 chapters or so of Genesis is, is, is a myth and these people have disappeared, what, what, why, is that, why are they being mentioned? And verse seven oh. this is a promise isn't it it says verse 70 that he that hath an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the ecclesias to him that overcometh will i give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god this is a promise of god that there will, there'll be access to this tree of life well the tree of life it's in Genesis chapter 2, it's in Genesis chapter 3, okay, Genesis chapter 4. If it didn't exist, then why is God promising us something which is a, a, a myth? What does the Bible say? Well, Psalm says this, Psalms say this, O Lord, how manifold are, how many are all thy works. In wisdom thou hast made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Isaiah, thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? For all these things hath mine hand made, and all these things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Psalm 33, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. Not the idea that you can somehow look at one fossil and then another fossil and say, well, there's a link between the two, but we can't prove it. There's no evidence. All his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the seas together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught and maketh the devices of the people of none effect. If you go down the evolutionary route, God either has nothing to do with it or we're left with a God who, who uh, creates a huge amount of, of confusion and disorganisation. And also, if you think about the idea of evolution as well, supposedly going back over billions of years, it relies on death. If something, if a creature doesn't die, it doesn't need to outwit its predators or anything like that. The whole idea of evolution relies on death and you're trying to somehow um, make your species survive longer by, 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 by do, making the changes you need to outwit your predators and so on. If death didn't exist, as the Bible says, if death only came into being when in Adam's day, then the basis for evolution is gone. And my final reference is this. I mentioned toward the start about uniformitarianism, the idea that for really billions of years that the, the earth has been much the same. The sun has risen, the sun has set, the earth has turned and everything has been the same. And that's the, the background that allows, um, has allowed this evolution to take place. I remember watching a, a science, supposedly science program a few years ago. There was, um, there was a thing on TV called, uh, I'm going to say Astronomy, Astronomy Live. I can't remember what it's called now, but um, it was presented by that Dara O'Brien guy. He's a bit of an astronomer and it was at uh, Jodrell Bank. And, and people know I'm into astronomy and they said, oh, you should watch this. But with it being a BBC programme, I knew exactly what it would be about. At some point, they'd start to talk about life on other planets. Have you ever wondered why this uh, is this obsession? I'm a bit, of, a bit of a hobby horse about this, about life on other planets is because they're trying to show it happened. It evolved somewhere else. OK, every time you see Star Wars and all these other things, uh, you know, Star Trek and it, whether all these things, that creatures from other planets, beings from other planets, notice they all speak English. Um, it's basically saying these have all evolved somewhere else. OK, it's all underpinning this idea of evolution. The scientists say, well, you know, there's all these planets around all these stars. And they and and, and what scientists are looking at is a smallest change in the, in the light coming from a star, the smallest wobble in the light output from a star, the faint dimming of a planet going across a star. And, the, and before you know it, they're showing you pictures of, 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 of mountains and lakes and things on these on these planets. 
if, sci if scientific programs had the health warnings on them that adverts do to say, you know, you've got to show something which is true, then a lot of what you see would, be, would disappear from science programs. And I remember seeing this astronomy program and they were talking to a, a young lady. She was a, a astrophysicist or something. And she was talking about what has supposedly happened in the first few uh, uh, millionths of a second after the Big Bang. Because you can go into a science, science books and you can go on the internet and read about what happened in the first few millionths of a seconds after the Big Bang. And, and, and she just regurgitated it, just recited this stuff. And I always think of this verse. It says, were, were you there? when I laid the foundation of the earth. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were the base, or on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid the cornerstone? If we believe that God is the creator, and we believe that he created it in the way it's set out in our Bibles, then it gives us a, a hope, a hope that that Christ will return, a hope that our sins can be removed and that we can be in that, uh, a relationship with God, that we can pray to God for any, uh, about every aspect of our lives, because there is a God, an all-knowing creator who is there. Once we say that God was behind some uh, nonsense that there, there's no evidence for, uh, then it destroys the very credibility of God, I think. Hopefully I've convinced you that not only is evolution uh, completely implausible, but we need to believe in a God that set out who he is and how he's done things according to the Bible, because without faith, uh, there is no hope for any of us. Thank you.